Open to Revelation chapter 3, and where we're going to start, where I start right out um, each week is I start out by reading the whole chapter, and then we're going to try to go verse by verse right through it. We have 22 verses to get through here today, and I'm hoping it's going to be a blessing. This series is a layman's look at Revelation. I'm the layman, and um, not have not been trained. I've just uh, been studying, and there are a lot of things that that we'll be looking at right here, and I'm encouraging you to be looking through the book of Revelation and studying it also as we go through there. And I got a lot of pages of notes right here, so if we have do you have questions or comments, I'm asking that at the end that we would bring those in, and then um, I don't know that I'd be able to answer them, but you're going to at least hear what, what my view is based on what I've seen and what I've studied up right here. So Revelation chapter 3, if you're open to it, you can follow right along with me as we read the whole chapter, starting in verse, of course, in verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have found, not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Verse 7 of chapter 3. And unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth I know thy works behold I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and has not denied my name behold I will make them of the synagogue of Satan which say they are Jews and are not but do lie behold I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold thou fast, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man may take thy crown. Him that overcometh, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write up upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. God, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me 
in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let's pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, you have given these churches and us in the church age a message through each and every one of these churches. Lord, you, we see how you regard your church. And Lord, we want to regard your church through your eyes and with your love and with your desire that you have. Lord, help us here at Community Baptist Church as we just even open this, this word this morning in chapter 3 and look at a small portion of this scripture. I pray, Lord, that you would work on our hearts, though. I pray that Community Baptist Church would be a, a church that is worthy of commendation for you and that is growing and is working on individuals and as a group of believers and pleasing you. Lord, I, I pray that you'd be with us during our Sunday school hour. Be with the, the children downstairs and the teens downstairs. And also, Lord, uh, during our morning service. And I just pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in all that is done here. Lord, I do pray uh, for Israel also and, and the things that are going on over there. I pray for those who have lost loved ones. I pray for the, the hostages that um, have been taken. And Lord, I, I just pray that, that your hand would be upon them. And as our pastor prayed last week, Lord, I pray that they would be saved, that they would come to, new, to know you as their personal Savior. Lord, I do lift up our, our dear sister Sharon and Bob, Lord, and I, I just pray that, that you would give healing to, to Sharon. And Lord, be with Sharon and Bob. Get them back here soon with us, Lord, so that we can fellowship with them. And Lord, help, help um, her to heal and to feel better and Bob to take just wonderful care of her, I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. Well, we are in our little section. Actually, we're coming to the end of a section today. If you just turn maybe a page back and look at uh, chapter 1 in Revelation and verse 19, this is the outline uh, the, for Revelation where we had already looked at at the very, very beginning, write the things which thou hast seen. That would be chapter 1 in Revelation, the things that had happened in the past. And then it says, and the things which are, and this is the angel speaking to John and telling him what to write, the things which are, are the church age. And so last week and this week, as we look in chapter 2 and 3, then this is, these are the letters to the churches. Uh, I mentioned last week that these are seven literal churches that were throughout Asia and the pathway on them. Um, and, and Brother Adam, I do have a very short PowerPoint on there. I sent you last week's? Well, that was not very intelligent. Okay, so I do not have a very short, short PowerPoint um, on there. And so um, apparently I sent the wrong one. But it was very short anyways. It had a uh, title slide said Revelation chapter 3. And then it had the, our picture from last week of the seven churches. And then really it only had an ending slide, which um, that's okay. It, it's not a big deal at all. But these are seven literal churches. And so... I I am taking it from the standpoint of these are written to these churches, yet they apply to every church in the church age. And I'm, I'm not stepping out to talk about the different, different portions of the church age that they may apply to, and there are some great arguments for that. That's just not what I'm, I'm going into right here. I'm saying, what can we learn from each of these seven churches, because we can. At Community Baptist Church today, we can learn from each of these churches about different things. So, and then next, no, not next week, but in two weeks, if the Lord tarries, in two weeks, then we'll get into the, the end of the, the last part of the outline, the things which shall be hereafter. Next week, we have the Pipers with us. And um, so then, Lord willing, I will be back up here in two weeks, starting in Revelation chapter 4, which is looking in the future at what God will do in the future. Yet, there are several things in this chapter right here that are some tough things that I, I think that we need 
need to hit on. So we're going to start right away at the letter to the church at Sardis. So in verse 1, this is unto the angel of the church in Sardis. So Sardis, uh, according to my research, Sardis was the capital of Lydia, and it was known for a couple different things, textiles, it uh, wood, or not wood, wool, um, pr production of wool and dyeing the wool and jewelry. And it was the home of the temple of Artemis and the church, um, the church that in this that we're talking about in Sardis actually existed, continued to exist until the 14th century. And then um, archaeologists have also found too that there was a church and not exactly sure, according to my research, if this was the, the church in Sardis here, but there was a church that was right next to the pagan temple also. And so it could have been this church. So as we look at verse 1, we saw last week that um, as Jesus was introduced as to the churches that there were several times that different types of introductions and I don't want to look terribly far into it but look in verse 1 it says these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and I'm convinced that that is the the Holy Spirit and the the seven spirits being complete the completion of all that and the seven stars and so this introduction in him this could be a a um, reference to the complete wisdom of our God, that he has this complete wisdom, and him holding the seven stars, which we know are the seven angels to the churches, that could show that he has complete control over everything that is going on here. And so looking at that, it's a little bit of a different introduction, but then he starts right out with a rebuke in this one. I know thy works. And that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. They had a name that it looked, it appeared that they were alive to those that were around them. But in God's eyes, they were dead. This is the, the, actually the closest thing that, to a commendation. So this is a rebuke that happens right away. I could, the closest thing that I could find was skipping down to verse 4. The, the closest co commendation was that thou hast a few names which have not defiled their garments. That was the best thing that was said in this little part right here. It comes out, that is a sad state for the church to be in, where God cannot, the only thing, say, hey, there, there are a few of you in there that have, have not stained your garments in that. And so they were thinking that they were surviving, but in God's eyes, they were dead. Now, I'm not sure exactly what the reason was that they were dead, but it could be, if we think about it, that they were living in the midst of of all these pagans and pagan practices. It could be that they were comparing themselves to the others around them and they looked pretty good. And, or it, it could just be saying, hey, we're surviving, we're getting by, we, we have the income that we need, we're, we're doing the things that we should do. You know, sometimes it may seem like the best of, we're doing the, and when we compare ourselves to others, it may seem like we're doing okay. But Christ looks upon the heart. Jesus looks, knows what our heart is. And that's why I say at Community Baptist Church here, we want to make sure, hey, we're not just getting by on Sundays. Hey, we had our services. We had our service Wednesday night. We want to be making an impact for Christ. We want to be serving him. He, Christ proclaimed that this church was dead even while they were living, and really, that's the only evaluation that really matters. It doesn't matter what everybody else around said, oh, they do nice things, they do these great things. What do we in Christ's eyes? You know, there was a commentator um, that I came across here that said when a church is danger and death, in danger of death, of spiritual death, and listed a few things right here, which I thought I thought were are pretty good. So one of them was it begins to worship its own past. It looks at the things that it has done in the past. We've done all these great things. Instead of, again, looking to where does God have us going now? And if you start to do that, that's a start of spiritual death. It's more concerned with forms than with life. More concerned about, hey, we're, we're doing what we're supposed to do instead of 
the people out there in, around us, the people in the seats, and growing spiritually. It loves systems more than it loves Jesus Christ. That is a way to spiritual death, that for a church and even for individuals too. And finally, this, this author also said, it is more concerned with material things than with spiritual things. If we here at Community Baptist Church, if we're more concerned about the landscaping, if we're more concerned about the, the building, which by the way, those are, those are things that we should be maintaining also, but if that takes place over the spiritual things, the things that God wants for us, then that's a way to spiritual death. And that's never where we want to go. I don't know what's happening, what exactly it was in this church, but here's what I do know. God said that they were spiritually dead. And so that is what really matters. Verse 2. Verse 2 is a further condemnation where it says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. They're told that there were things that were not dead yet, but they were ready to die. And I look at that and I, I think it's possibly people that were in the church that maybe wanted to grow. They want to, but they're not getting led in that direction. They're being taken in a different direction that wasn't to spiritual life. And again, I say, what a sad commentary on the church. That if there are things that are on, on the verge of dying, I, I think about somebody, you know, that got in an accident and they needed whatever. They, they just needed pressure on a wound. That's what they need because they're bleeding out and not even willing to step up because maybe because you don't want to get dirty. You don't want to get bloody. And this church right here said, it, God says that, hey, there are things that are ready to die. They're ready to die. But you're not, you're not helping them out. And it says, strengthen them. This is where you got to look. This is exactly where we need to look to. And the works were not found perfect before God. The church really should be a place where people are encouraged, where people are strengthened. And yet, this is one. This church in Sardis is where people were coming to die. And that is a sad state. I think about this, and I was going to mention this a little bit later on, but um, I, I don't feel that this is where Community Baptist Church is, but I, I feel this is something we need to be on guard for. And one of the reasons why is because I got a phone call yesterday, and that phone call, somebody said, hey, I'm praying for your Sunday school lesson. And that's what I'm doing. I'm, I want you to know I'm praying for that. I got last week or a couple weeks ago, I had somebody deliver, hand something to me and say, hey, maybe this will help you on your Sunday school lesson right there. I look at that and I say, wow, what a blessing. I know I, I, I don't need everybody to do all the, those kind of things, but I know that you're studying. I know that you're praying. I know that you're here also. I know there are people watching and listening online, people who want to grow. And that is just a blessing to me. To, to have that happen, and, and I, I think that's what we need to make, make sure that we're doing as a church. Verse 3. Verse 3, God gives an exhortation for the church. He says, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. There it is, turning again. There has to be a turning from our ways and a turning to God. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. So the, ch the church is told to repent, to hold fast, to watch. And aren't we told that we should be watching also. We are to be looking for what the Lord has for us, what the Lord even wants to direct us. I'm not even talking about watching for the end times, although I'm sure your ears were perked up this week about watching for the end times. I'm saying, I'm watching, we need to be as Community Baptist Church, Lord, what do you have for us to do? Where, what do you have as individuals? Who do you have for us to talk to, Lord? Can we watch what you have for us? So this city, Sardis, had been invaded by enemies in 549 BC. Cyrus had invaded them. And then again in 214 BC by Antiochus the Great. Okay, but this, is, this was the deal with Sardis. It was a city that, was, that sat high above a valley and there were cliffs that were like impossible to scale on the sides and they felt comfortable. 
They felt like they could not be invaded until they were overtaken like a thief in the night. But see what God did in this, I believe it seems like this is a reference to this, that they would take, they would know what that means to be overtaken, to think everything was okay and they were just overtaken. But look in verse three, it says, if therefore thou shalt not watch, God's telling them, hey, you need to watch spiritually. He says, I will come upon thee. Now God doesn't say that, that, he wouldn't come upon if they were watching. He's just saying, hey, you need to be watching. You need to know what time it is there. And he says, you would not know the hour. I, I will come upon thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour that, they, that I will come upon thee. God warned them that they were vulnerable, not only with their location. They thought they were safe, and they came up those cliffs, but they were vulnerable spiritually. And he said, hey, you need to be watching. And I think it, it would be a reference to like, hey, I, I remember. I know what that exactly means right there. Verses 4 through 6 then. Say, thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear to hear... He, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. All right, so we're going to tackle a couple things right in here. So starting out, those who, are, who remain true to Christ, it says they will be given a white raiment. Okay, and so they'll be dressed in white. Well, white raiment is, was white was worn at weddings and other fe festive occasions. It shows that there was an acceptance, a purity of acceptance by God. And at and later on in Revelation, in uh, chapter 19, verses 7 through 9, at the marriage supper of the, land, uh, of the Lamb, the, the people who are invited are wearing white. So there is something about this festive occasion. And there is also a promise that the overcomer, now last week we mentioned about the overcomer in 1 John also, and he that overcomes is the one who trusts in Christ. We are promised to be overcomers by trusting in Christ. But if we look at this right here in verse 5, there may be a little bit of controversy that comes up. Because it says in verse 5, toward the second little sentence there, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Which brings me to what is then the book of life. Okay, so the book of life could be, I'm going to throw out just a couple possibilities right there. It could be a life of physical life. Like when you were born as a human, then th that God gives you rights that you have book, in, or that you have life in in the book there, okay? Or it could be spiritual life as a born-again Christian that you are put in the book. Okay, but then let's just take a look at this. A lot of people would say, but if this blotting out the name out of the book of life, does this mean that God would take away somebody's salvation as they were now I hope you know where I'm gonna go with that I I hope you know that all right and so maybe not okay so here we go no, God will not take away anybody's salvation. And how do we know that? We can look back at other parts of the Bible, and it is clear that when you are saved, you have eternal or everlasting life. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That has to be, if God says you're going to have everlasting life for for belief and then you then he says but I may blot you out then you see where the problem is the problem is well then it's on me 
to keep all of these things, to keep that. And it says it, it would be based on my actions to keep that salvation. And our salvation and continuance would be based on that and not on Jesus. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So as we look at this and we, we try to tackle a few things on here, maybe at the end, maybe you'll have a comment about this too. But think about this, that even if it with the book of life is a spiritual life, it doesn't mean that others will be blotted out because they are, that faithful people will stay in there and unfaithful will be blotted out. But we know that we have the promises of God. In fact, it never says that God will blot out names, although he does bring out Bring up the fact that he says, hey, I won't blot out your names, but this is where we should be. Look what he says. He says, you're going to be faithful to me? I'm going to confess your name before my father and before his angels. Hey, I don't want to be living my life on the edge saying, I don't, I don't know if I'm overcoming, if I'm living this faithful life. I, I, I mean, I think we can think about some people that maybe made a confession at some point, but man, you don't see anything in their lives at all. Hey, I, I, God's their judge. Hey, if they meant that, that confession of faith, if they truly meant it, then I believe they're saved. That's what, that's what the Bible teaches right there. But then sometimes you're like, man, I don't see anything in their life. I sure would like to see some of that. Sometimes we think about that with family members. And we say, hey, I, I wish, you know, especially at a funeral. Hey, they made a profession way back in the day. You know, I, I, I hope they really meant it. And so anyway, here's, here's where I'm at right as of this right here. God's not going to take out anybody who is saved. He is not going to take your name out and say, hey, you weren't an overcomer. Mm, you, didn't, you didn't meet my criteria. There is a criteria. It is belief in Jesus Christ that he fully paid for our sin on the cross and we trust in him. That is the criteria. And so those who take Christ's invitation to faithfulness seriously will be the godly remnant prepared for God. So we have a personal responsibility. I'm looking at this right here, and this is not saying, hey, as Community Baptist Church, you all, you're going to, you know, I'm going to, God's going to confess you before um, his father. I'm saying that we have personal responsibility. The church has a responsibility also. And we as believers in commun at Community Baptist Church, we should be working together to be that faithful witness. Verse 7 talks about the, starts talking about the church at Philadelphia. And unto the and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true. He that hath the key of David, and he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. And so this is now a different, this is not um one of the descriptions that came from chapter one, when John saw Jesus right there, it was there was nothing about having the key of David and opening it and shutting it. And so, back in Isaiah chapter twenty-two, I'm going to try to get there really fast. You might beat me. Um, I'm just there's just one verse that I'm going to look at Isaiah twenty-two twenty-two, and this is talking about Eliakim. And uh, actually in verse 20, it says, ch chapter 22, verse 20, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with my robe and strengthen him with my girdle, with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a faith." A, faith, a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And so this is um, about Eliakim. I want to say a priest um, in here, but now I'm not exactly sure, so I'll just keep reading. Verse 22, and the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. I mean, that looks like the description of 
Well, Jesus right here, back in verse 7, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. So as we look at this, this was a... Um, Eliakim had that key to the house of David, and when he opened the door, they were allowed access to all the treasures of the king. But when he shut it, nobody was allowed access to those treasures. Christ is, Jesus Christ, is the Holy One with the key to the treasures of the king. There is none other. This is the one with the key. Looking at verses 8 and 9. I know thy works, speaking to the church of Philadelphia. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. As I look at this, as I read this several times through here, I started to think about the power that we have is very small. I mean, to, to, to make even an impact, even our, our, in our government, in our world, we don't have much power. And we, we can find that out very easily if we get a phone call from the doctor one day and we find out uh, there's something that needs to be checked out. And we're like, well, I'm powerless on all this. But Jesus is all powerful. He is God almighty, omnipotent, and he says, when I open the door, no man can shut it. Praise God for that. For you have, and Jesus knows where we're at too. It says in verse eight, for thou hast a little strength. You got little strength and you still kept my word and has not denied my name. We should, as Community Baptist Church and as individual believers, we should be looking for doors that God has opened because when he opens doors, he allows us to go in and to help others, whatever that is. And we should be saying, I'm going to go through them in the power of Christ, not in my own power. But Lord, you help me to go through this door. You guide me. You direct me. They are given the, the church at Philadelphia is given commendation because they got little strength. But look what they did. They kept his word. And they did not deny his name. Even as we face extreme opposition, which you never know, we may, and right here in Davison, Michigan, someday face extreme opposition, then we must realize that those people will be brought low by our God. We see it in verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. Does that sound like extreme opposition? The synagogue of Satan? Yeah, and it says, they say they're Jews, but not, but do lie. Behold, I, this is Jesus speaking, I will make them come and worship. And this was kind of interesting, before thy feet. Now we know that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Absolutely. But he's saying, hey, these people that are coming against you in this great opposition that you seem powerless against, because of my power, Jesus says, because of my power, what I'm going to make them do, I'm going to come make them worship before your feet because you've kept my word. Now, of course, we're not looking for worship right here. And it says, and to know that I have loved thee. See, God's going to do that to show us, hey, my love's been on you this whole time. Yeah, you've been around the synagogue of Satan right there. They've been coming at you in every direction. But that is, I, I have a great love for you. Verse 10 says, because I've kept my word, because I've kept the word of my patience, I will also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So because of the faithfulness of this church, and it says right there, it's saying, because thou hast kept my word, this is the reason why I'm doing this. Because of the faithfulness, God said he would reward them from this, keeping them from this hour of temptation. Now, I believe that this hour of temptation can be nothing else other than 
the great tribulation. Why? Because look what it says. It's going to come upon all the world. Everybody. It's not just that church right there, or it's not just a, a little local area. It's coming on all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So then we have to start to think about then what is God going to do? And is he only going to do it for the church at Philadelphia? Okay, it is, he says he will keep them from the hour. Not through the hour. There are some people that would say, oh no, God's just going to protect them as they go through. But I believe that, that that word from the hour means you keep them out of that. You take them totally out. This is a picture of the rapture of the church, that God takes his church out. And as we look at a couple things right here, that some may, may say, well, that's not a good enough argument for the pre-tribulation rapture. That promise, the promise that was given to this church right here, would actually be void, and so I want to get back to my notes right here, if the church is not removed before the tribulation begins. Because as we will see in the future here, that there will be, as as we get into the future chapters, that we'll see that there will be many believers that will suffer and will die during the tribulation. It's going to happen. God says it in his word. So these would have to be those then that were saved after the rapture. Those are the ones that will be suffered and persecuted during the tribulation. Praise God that he has chosen to reward his saints during the church age, his faithful saints. And so I got to say, as we look at this, and this is another reason why I say we need to take from every point right here, every church. This wasn't just for the church at Philadelphia. This is for the church age. And as we see right back down in verse 13, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. A little bit more about the rapture here that will be coming up. In fact, let in, in verse 11, it says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold thou fast which thou hast, so that, that no man can take thy crown. We already talked that coming quickly means that when it happens, it'll happen right away. Once God starts the whole process going, then it's not going to take much time all, at all. Turn to 1 Thessalonians. Keep your finger right there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You know, you know these things right here. You've heard them before. Chapter 4, verse starting at verse 13. But I would not have have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. What a reward. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This is a promise that was given to this church to, the, to be faithful. They were in an area where the synagogue of Satan was all around them right there. They felt powerless. They said, Jesus said, look unto my power. I will open the door. When I open the door, no man can shut it. And when I shut the door, no man can open it. I think that we can take a great comfort from that. But also it says in verse 11, a hold fast which thou hast that no man may take thy crown. Now that crown, we've already taught that salvation can never be taken away from us. But this is a warning, I believe, to us that we don't want to lose our rewards. Things that we have done that, are, that God is going to reward. And so can we lose our rewards? Yeah, we can. In fact, 2 John uh, verse 8 says, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, 
but that we receive a full reward. And we're not going to lose our salvation. We could lose our testimony. We could lose our reward. But we're not going to lose that salvation. But it says, hold fast. Jesus gives a warning. Hold fast. And then he that overcometh, look at verse 12. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear to hear, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So this, what could it mean to become a pillar unto you in the temple of my God? So think about what we've already seen about this church of Philadelphia. Jesus said, back up in verse 8, he said, hey, you got little strength, but you trust in my strength. And then look what he says. Look what the promise is later on. You're going to become a pillar in my temple. You overcome. You're faithful to the end. You're going to be the strong pillar that holds up my temple in the new Jerusalem. And um, I think we could even have an argument that the whole new Jerusalem is the temple of God. And that you become a pillar in that. What a great comfort it would be for these people. And also, I... I a little bit of a, a history about this. There were parts of Philadelphia that apparently had many earthquakes and had destroyed major parts of the city. And But it says there too, I mean, may, and maybe the people in this city were thinking about those earthquakes and the instability of it. And yet God says, hey, in the future... When you're in the New Jerusalem, you're going to be a pillar in that temple and nothing's going to shake you. And what a comfort I see that our God is given to these churches. There was no rebuke given to this church, nothing negative that was, saying, that was said to this church, but it was all exhortation, all building up this church. We don't deserve, I, I want to go back to this reward thing for just a second. We don't deserve a reward from our God. We deserve to be separated from him for eternity because we're sinners. But our God's great love, not only did he send his son Jesus Christ to pay the price for our sins so that we could be with him for eternity, but then he says this, hey, you're going to be faithful? Well, I'm going to give you rewards too. What a great God. What a great God he is. So, Let's go to uh, verse 14. And now we get to the last church, the Laodicean church, the church at Laodicea. And unto the church, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right? These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, the introduction of Jesus, right here, was saying that he is the standard. He is the beginning and the end. You know, he talks about the beginning of the creation in the amen, and we put amen at the end, and we say, so, so let it be done, I think is what amen ends up standing or meaning as we go through there. Jesus alone is the standard, and his word is the authority, and he's letting the Laodicean church know who is the standard. So Laodicea was a wealthy city, because it produced wool cloth. And there were other things in here too. Um, Dr. Riley, Dr. not Riley, brother, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Dr. Ryrie uh, says that it was a medical center and that it had ointment for treating ears and a powder that was like it, for treating the eyes. It was called like Phrygian powder or something like that. And it seemed to have all of its needs met. So much that it had all this wealth and all these things around it available to it that it may have just lulled that church to sleep. And so as we look at this, we're going to see that Jesus says that there are three spiritual states that are mentioned. You look at it with me right here in verse 15. I know thy works. Again, we can't get around that at all. There is nothing that Jesus does not know about you and me and our church right here. I know. I know it all. Okay, there's nothing that we're, we're getting away with, not that we're trying to, but even in our individual lives, that anything that we, that we uh, think nobody else has seen, Jesus knows them. And this is what he says about this church. Thou art neither cold nor hot. 
I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because that thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So there are three spiritual states that are mentioned. The first one is cold. Okay, so you're not cold. And the cold would, would seem to be an unbeliever's reaction to Jesus Christ. Hey, I, I don't care about that stuff, all right? Don't even bother me with it. I've got other stuff that's going on in my life. And so they're cold to any of that. Well, then uh, the absolute opposite of that, the hot would be those who have show a genuine faith in Jesus Christ. They desire to learn about him. They desire to follow him. They desire to, to repent, to change their lives, and to follow, to be an overcomer, to be faithful. But then, so where's the lukewarm? So we got the cold, those who don't even care, those who are all in for Jesus are the hot, and the lukewarm is somewhere in between. And so the somewhere in between Maybe that they heard the gospel, they were touched by it. And I'm not going to even say they received the gospel, but it sure isn't clear whether they belong to Christ or not. And so wherever this is in the middle, as we're looking at the cold and the hot, Jesus hates it. He, he does not, it is not good in God's eyes. And how do we know that? Because of his word. It says in verse 16, because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I'm going to spew thee out of my mouth. It, it is a, a taste that is like, like if, if you were to drink, I'm trying to think of something really gross, prune juice. Okay, I don't, I'm, I'm okay with prune juice, all right? So, uh, but, but, but if you drink something and it, it went rancid, let's say that, you know, something that went rancid and you're like, Pluh! I, I can't have it in my mouth. Lukewarmness is obnoxious to God. And that's why he says, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. He, God wants a true relationship with us. He doesn't want us to, to ride the fence, to be just like, yeah, I, got, I got one foot in the world, I got one foot in the church, and then, you know, whatever I feel like that day, that's, where I, that's not what God wants for us. And, and I, I'll say it's because he is a jealous God, that is true, but he's a jealous God because this is what's best for us, to be serving him. It is the best life that we could possibly have. And he doesn't want to say, sometimes I want the best life. Sometimes I want, you know, whatever. Whatever ends up coming that way. You, we can't fool God. There are no other sins that I saw mentioned here about this church. But half-heartedness was enough. Enough that God said, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. A couple of sources that I saw, and I don't know if they used each other or not, they said that Laodicea was famous for mineral springs that produced water that could, you could either drink it hot or you could drink it cold, but it became sickening if it was lukewarm. Now, I don't know if that's true or not in there, but um, a, a couple sources I saw that had it. And so then we look at this Laodicean church after God says, hey, I'm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. But look at what in verse 17, their assessment of themselves. And then we're going to look at God's assessment too. It's all given to us right here. Verse 17, because thou sayest, so here's their assessment, I am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. You see, they were looking at self-sufficiency that whole time. I got everything that I need. Everything is going good. But God saw it much differently at the end of verse 17. And it says, and knowest not that thou art, and he's, God's going to say what they really were. He could see what they were. He said, you're wretched. You're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. You think you got these great wool and these textiles and all these things, you're covered. I got everything that I need. God says, not in my eyes from where I'm seeing it. And what really matters, you're wretched, you're poor, you're naked. I missed some things. Miserable. They didn't even know that they were miserable. They thought everything was going great. You know, many times a lukewarm attitude toward God is 
accompanied when you have an exaltation of material things and when things are going good, in, in contrast to spiritual riches. And so I think in America, especially, we got to kind of watch out for that. We all definitely have to watch out for that. I mean, we see the commercials. We see these people, you know, that have all these great things right there. And we, someone would think, hey, that's where I want to be. That's what I want to be driving. That's what I want to, whatever that is. But sometimes we can put that in place of the spiritual riches. It's easy to think that things are going great in our lives when we're healthy, when we can pay the bills, but all that, it can be all be falling apart spiritually. We might not even know that we're wretched. So how do we know? How do we know if we're wretched, we're miserable with all that? God wants us to know by self-evaluation according to his word. God counsels the church then in verse 18, and this is what he says, his counsel to the church. Because remember what God wants. God, God could have said, hey, I, I just wiped that church out. You know, you're gone. Okay, but no, instead he says, this is what I want. I want you to be right with me. That's what God wants. That's his heart. Verse 18, I counsel thee. This is my counsel, God's counsel to them. Buy of me gold tried in the fire. Of course, they're not taught, God was not talking about literal gold. You know, that, that you go to Oxford gold or something like that. He's not saying that. He's saying that I have some, this, this gold that represents true riches. You want true riches? They come from me, God says. You got to come to me. Only God can give them. They're blessings that God can give upon our lives and upon our home. He can give us contentment with where he has placed us. He can give us security in our relationship with God on this earth and for eternity. Only God can do that. That You, you can only get it from God. You can't get it from these material things. And that is so much better than any of those material things. In verse 18, continuing on, that thou mayest be rich. You see, the richness is not those, those material. It is the spiritual things. The second thing that he says that they can get is white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. The white raiment would symbolize or could symbolize our unfeigned purity before God and the blessings that come from living a pure life. You know, there are blessings for living a pure life. There are, if you are, um, if, if you stay um, sexually pure, and, and you, you end up marrying a spouse that is sexually pure and you stay pure there. Hey, you really don't have to worry about these sexually transmitted diseases and things like that. They're blessings. Uh, uh, the family, as the family is together and raising the children, there are blessings that go, hey, there are, I know there are still, still some things that can come up there too. But God says, hey, you're going to get the purity. You're going to get it from me. You're going to be clothed in white. This place in in Laodicea was known for their luxurious black wool and that black wool that would be sold around the world and yet the white garments may have represented something that they couldn't buy. Of course, these are not literal garments. They're the purity that only God can give and only live in the life for him. And then finally in verse 18, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Well, the eye salve would allow them to see their position with God and see what, what they have to do to, to get right with God. And as I said earlier, there were some people that say that there was this Phrygian powder, it's like P-H-R-Y-G-I-A-N, that was an eye ointment that was in Laodicea, but it couldn't cure spiritual blindness. It couldn't let people know where they were in their position with God, but God through his Holy Spirit promises that he will illuminate our path. And now we, we, we sang that song in choir before, now I can see, now I can see, because God is the only one. It's only through God that he can say, hey, I'm going to give you the eyes I have that you're going to be able to see, and you're going to be able to see what I have. We no longer have to stumble through this world, but we can follow wherever he leads us and where he guides us. This church thought they had everything that they needed, but they were 
sadly mistaken. That's why we need to examine ourselves. I think that's why the Bible says also when we come together for communion, let a man examine himself. Okay, but it shouldn't just be for those days. I mean, it should be every day. Lord, show me. Teach me. Be in the word of God. Lord, show me my heart. Search me, O oh Lord. Try me. That's what our prayer should be. Verse 19. Oh, and by the way, as we examine ourselves, we want to be on that hot side, of course, too. We want, don't want to be the cold side. We want to be, Lord, show me, and I want to follow. Verse 19 says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. God loves his children. So he's going to rebuke us. And as he rebukes us, it's not, again, to punish us. It is to get us on the right path to get us going the correct way. Verses 20 through 22 are the call to repent. And what, what God says to this Laodicean church, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Isn't that kind of a sad state? That he's saying to the church, and also we could look at this as individuals too, but to his church, he's standing at the door and knocking and saying, if you open any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in with him and sup with him and he with me. So, God stands at the door of our hearts as individuals and as the church. And he says, any man, it doesn't matter. doesn't matter who they are. It is a call to that any man, there's nobody that's gone too far. Nobody that's gone past the point while they're still living that God says, I won't open the door to. I, you stand at the door and knock. Jesus says that he will open the door and come in and sup with them. Now, sup is like where it's talking about supper, okay, which is the most important or the main meal of the day. And many times an honored guest would be invited to that, to the supper portion of the meal. And what a comfort it is to know that Jesus says, hey, you, you, I stand at the door and knock, you open the door, I'm going to come in, I'm going to sup with you, and you're going to sup with me as an honored guest. Not, not just, and again, that's God's great love for us, that he says, hey, you're my honored guest. You come in here, how can we be God's honored guest? Because of his great love for us. It doesn't stop then just at supper, though. In his great love for us, look at what it says that he offers to us in verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. I'm going to finish that. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Jesus offered us offers us to come in and sit with him in his throne. Think about this. He says, just as my father did, this is the son of God that gave his life for the whole world. And the father says, you come sit with me on my throne. And then Jesus says the same to us. He says it to us. We don't deserve that. That is only because of the righteousness that is poured out on us through Jesus because of that, we're treated the same as Jesus was treated by the Father. So as we wrap up right here, here's some dangers that we can look out for the message to the seven churches. Act like there is a slide up there on the screen right now. So Ephesus, the danger for Ephesus was the danger of losing their first love. And we need to look out for that also. The danger at Smyrna, there was fear and suffering. They were, they were afraid of what was going on around them and that they would suffer and that there would not be any, any uh, rescue for them. Pergamus, there was a danger of doctrinal compromise. They, they were um, allowing, remember it was that woman, that Jezebel, that was in there. Uh, Thyatira, there was the danger of moral compromise where they were allowing things into their lives. Sardis, as we saw today, there was a danger of spiritual deadness. Philadelphia, there was a danger of not 
looking to Jesus for the power and holding fast to that power. And then Laodicea, there was a danger of lukewarmness, of having a foot in the world, a foot in with our Lord. So we need to look at the church the way that God does. You know, it's, it's so easy for us. We're humans. We're sinners. That is, that is true. It's so easy for us to get in little squabbles with each other. Uh, he didn't look at me when I, in church, walked right by me, didn't even say a thing, you know, and pastor, what he said up there and, you know, made a joke up there and I got upset about it right there. You know, really what we need to do, we need to look at what God wants for our church. And instead of just saying, you know, getting critical of each other, we need to be working together. And we need to be looking at these, these warnings, these dangers right here. Let's hear what God says to the churches. It's said seven times in there. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I'm going to pray, and then we've got a minute for comments or questions or anything right there. Let's pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this revelation that was given unto John for these churches and applies to our church here today. And I pray, Lord, for Community Baptist Church that we would look at each of these commendations and these condemnations, these exhortations that we would be lifted up because of the great God that we have and that we serve. And Lord, that, that we would be looking to please you and all that is done here at Community Baptist Church. Be with us during our morning service, Lord. Help us to, with pure hearts, be worshiping you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Comments, questions, anything out there? Cheryl had her mouth open for a second. Hey, Lord willing, in two weeks, we'll be before the throne of God. Hey, we may be before, before the throne. We can go before the throne of God. We have access to the throne. But I'm saying that maybe, maybe we'll be raptured before then. What a blessing. All right, I'll see you then. You got a comment, question? When you were talking about the white robe. Yeah. What's in that mind when we come back with Christ, we'll get on white horses and white robes. Yeah, yeah, we'll be coming back on those white horses and the white robes. We'll be coming back ready for a battle, but the battle, we know who wins that battle right there. Amen. Yes, he yes, sir. About what he was talking about, he's got to clothe us. Adam and Eve put on fibs. <coughs> Guys, that's not good enough. Yeah. You were doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put the skin on you. Absolutely. Amen. Yeah, and well, there's a whole lesson right there in that one, too. Yeah. Well, God bless you and get prepared for our morning service.